So from what I know, you don't know a lot of the music scene, but I would like to ask you about the politics and the oh. cultures from the 50s yeah. onwards. So just a little introduction of yourself. So who you are. First of all, thanks for approaching us. We, we do like to support <coughs> students in their work. So I'm Andrew Kelly. I'm director of an organisation called Bristol Cultural Development Partnership, which is a partnership of both Bristol's universities, um, Business West, which is the Chamber of Commerce, and Bristol City Council. And we're what's called a national portfolio organisation, which is an arts council funded organisation. And our projects range over many years. You know, we've been in existence since 1993. And in the early days, you know, we were working on <coughs> big projects like um, what's now called We the Curious on the harbour side, the at Bristol um, Centre, <coughs> Science Centre. And, um, and then we led Bristol's bid to be capital of European culture, 2008, uh, and so on and so on. So we've done lots of things in Bristol. Um, the biggest connection we've had with the music scene, well, there's been a number really. The first is, um, it's always been there in terms of quite a strong component of Bristol's cultural um, provision, heart, however you call it, particularly in recent years, I would say. Um, we, for example, joined the Capital of Culture bid, which I think the year it took place was 2002, did a really big concert in Queen Square with Massive Attack, for example, um, and with Ronnie Size and so on. Um, um, we were also trying to create a new concert hall for the city, and we, we spent many years working on that, but that didn't work. But the Bristol Beacon now, the former Colston Hall, um, has um, has taken that forward in a in a very good way, and and should be you know renewed um, over the next couple of years now. It's, they've, they've got everything in place, so we've done lots of things. Um, our, our main aim is to bring together arts and sciences. I would say. Um, so for us, I know you want to ask about culture and the meaning of culture and so on. That that's a very broad definition for us, but perhaps we'll we'll come on to that. Let me just quickly put down the second question. It's it's pretty much what you mentioned before how we're going to um just kind of like going more into the topic of like politics and culture i know it's not something that you can easily combine yeah. in one co um, yeah. paragraph my question is what's the difference between culture and politics and more specifically like the general idea of politics because when i started this project and i knew i had to do a website for it my big concern was when my viewers at when the viewers go on the website do what kind of idea of politics do they have in mind is it something based on human rights is it something based on parties is it something based on the environment or can it be like not in a way generalized but can it be in a way oh this is what it's about this is what i'm focusing in in some sense so i just want to know um what is like your thoughts on like politics in bristol in other words like the general idea I mean, you've chosen two of the most difficult words to define, actually, in the, I mean, you know, culture is a very difficult word to define. When we bid for European capital of culture, you had to um, submit, the first bid was 12 pages, and you had a page for each question. And the first question you were asked to say was, what is your definition of culture? And they would have got, you know, 12 bidders would have given 12 very different definitions of culture, I think. I mean, you know, th there is the classic dictionary definition of, you know, almost like rooting and um, nurturing and so on. Um, there's the one that we had, which was about, for us, culture um, is, is a number of things. You know, it's, it's, it's high art, it's music, it's theatre, it's drama. But it's also the culture of the everyday. It's how people live their lives. It's about, you know, for some people, their culture is the local pub or the um, or the, 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 the reading group they're involved in in their street and so on. So really, it's about, you know, you could say most broadly, it's about, you know, how people live their lives and what they get from it uh, themselves. Um, but that's not very helpful in a way. Um, for, for, for these things. Um, one of the things that we started to look at was um, th there was this view in the 50s actually um, based on um, someone called C.P. Snow who was a novelist but also a, um, a, um, uh, worked in government 
And he talked about the two cultures of arts and sciences and the fact that they never really came together. And we were interested in this as a way of reflecting what Bristol um, was good at really. So we, we, we define culture as arts and sciences. So we've, been, we've done projects, for example, on, um, on um, engineering in Bristol, principally through the, 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 um, the engineer Isambard Kingdom Brunel, who you know, built the Clifton Suspension Bridge and the railway line between London and Bristol and so much more on the SS Great Britain, which is in the city. Um, and, um, and we felt that culture there was about creation and about the creator. So, you know, there is a term used nowadays, which is creative, some people use, as against artists. So it's, you know, people create in different ways. Um, they create in engineering, they create in, um, in, in management terms, they create in the arts, they create in sport and so on. Again, it, it's widening a definition which makes it slightly unhelpful in the end for work that takes place. Um, and it's hard for funders as well, for example, but, you know, the New Arts Council strategy is called Let's Create. And it's really about the creators of work as against, you know, a top down definition of, of what culture means. Um, the, and the other things that we were very keen on when it came to culture was about the culture of the local. So it's about what Bristol is, has been good at. So, you know, that's why we did, for example, in our early work, focused on things like um, one of the strongest parts of Bristol's culture, for example, is natural history media. You know, every film made about the natural world, which is shown around the world, there's a 70% chance it's made from Bristol, you know, whether it's about wildlife or the environment or, or whatever. Um, so we, we set up this project called, then it was called Bristol 2000. It became something called At Bristol, and it's now called We the Curious, which was a, a nature and science centre, because at the same time as well, Bristol was very strong in, what, what then was called hands-on science, which is, you know, basically people doing science um, for themselves and not being, you know, experimenting and so on. There was a, a famous, not, not so well known now, sadly, building a Temple Mead Station called the Exploratory, which started all that work off. So for us, it's about, you know, arts and sciences together. Uh, and that, you know, brings in things like technology. Um, and, you know, when we started, as I said, there was, the internet was in its very early stages in 1993 and is now kind of dominates all our lives. It's about what's important locally. And that, that for us is about, you know, what the city has been good at in the past. So music is obviously one of those key areas, but also animation, natural history media, um, theatre. Um, Bristol has a very strong visual arts tradition. It has a strong filmmaking tradition um, it, uh, and so on, and, and a strong literature tradition and more. Um, but it's also about what's important for people locally. So last year, for example, we did a project on the council estate. It was the 100th anniversary of the, the council house, sorry, the council estate, of which Bristol was a pioneering city. And, and you know, around that grew things like, you know, libraries, communities and so on. So, so it, it is a really hard word to nail down and is often left to you to self-define almost and we took it the view being very much about we were in Bristol we needed to root it in the locality and the strengths of the locality but we also wanted to see it as, a, as an act of creation um, which is why we were interested so, so take the character for example of of Brunel you know he was you know t in 2006 it was the 200th anniversary of his birth he he was the greatest engineer of his time you know he, when he created something he didn't just move it technology along slightly he, it was by leaps and bounds you know shipping railways transport bridges whatever um, but he was also his work is incredibly beautiful you know he's very influenced by artists and so on and so you know creating great things and making them beautiful is perhaps one of the one of the one of the definitions you can use when it comes to politics I mean in a way you've summed up the answer yourself in, in you know people for politics, you know, that might be, you know, the, um, the, 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 you know, it may be people just define their politics as I vote or don't vote, in fact. It might be issue based the, around the environment or around Black Lives Matter or around uh, feminism and things like that. Um, there's the obviously the politics is also about the mechanisms of government and about how they operate. Um, you know, so we, we, you know, one of the things we're working on next year 
is a series of events around the constitution because you know we we you know we, we, we kind of british voting system doesn't really reflect and never has done the people's voting you know the fact that we still have this you know i mean you know 2020 we still have something called the house of lords for example seems ridiculous um the fact that you know it's only recently that more women have been elected as mps you know um very few although it's slightly getting better you know and um, you know i can remember not so long ago when there were no non-white mps for example in the house of commons um so for some of people it's about the mechanisms of government for some it's about the locality again you know i mean you know politics say in bristol has, has shifted enormously in recent years you know in it, it's now very much a labor dominated city uh, but it wasn't so long ago that the liberal democrats were in charge for example you go back to the 1920s in bristol and there was um i think it was then or maybe it was slightly later but anyway there was something called the bristol citizens party which was basically the conservative party under a different name um and um and 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 similarly you've had the growth of you know, very different sort of electoral system in Bristol with the introduction of the mayoral model, you know, a, 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 an elected mayor that we have. Um, but, you know, I think that, you know, politics is also about what you can achieve to make change happen. And, um, and culture is about creating change in some ways or just creating great and beautiful things in whatever level you do them. Vaclav Havel, who became the prime president of Czechoslovakia after the after the communism, he was a playwright, um, writer, and he merged politics and culture remarkably. I thought um, it might be worth you just looking up him to see what he had to say about some of these things. And for him as well, politics was the art of the possible. You know, and that's the other thing. You know, for you know, politics can be incredibly utopian. You know, you, you can, you know, in fact, some of the worst regimes of the 20th century were, were utopian regimes, you know, communism and Nazism. Um, you know, but it's also about the art of what can you achieve within the constraints you have. And then they all merge together in a way through things like how you fund culture and then the politics of funding culture and so on. I don't envy you your task, by the way. This is a, you know, the, this is a, you know, two big subject areas, but, um, but I think that that's, you know, and in a way you can, you may not come to a conclusion, which is probably the correct thing in itself, in the sense that, you know, you, um, you know, there's so many differing interpretations of these words. Politics is a slightly easier word to discuss than culture, I would say. What you also have is, you know, um, different countries' views. So, um, for example, um, in Russia during the uh, communist period, politics and culture were simply merged. You wouldn't have distinguished between them, that the you know, film was, the, was an art, propaganda arm of the state. You know, the visual arts were, were, were part of the state's work. Um, in Scotland at the moment, you have quite an interesting thing around where the uh, Nicola Sturgeon is a fantastic consumer of culture. You know, she tweets about the book she's just read. And, um, and you kind of think, you know, other leaders don't do that. You certainly couldn't imagine Donald Trump tweeting about the books he's read, you know, and um, but even Boris Johnson, who does, I think, read a lot. He doesn't do that. Uh, and I suppose that links on to another point. Sorry, I'm really rambling now, but I hope this is useful, um, which is about um, how sometimes politicians are embarrassed by culture, are embarrassed by the arts and so on. You, you know, you don't often get them, you know, you know, being too upfront about them, um, I find. Obama did this well as well. Obama you know, and Michelle, uh, both of them, you know, loved reading and they loved music. You know, the concerts they held at the White House, you know, were a, you know, were, were, were no president before. And, and you know, I can imagine um, the vice president doing it. I'm not sure that Joe Biden would do it, but, um, you know, the, the way they integrated those, that, that into their, and they, it was just part of their life, really. And, and you know, it was such a refreshing change to see. Yeah, no, with the Obama part, um, I completely understand. I follow Obama and he always shows off his Spotify playlist. And no. This is also the idea that as well as like showing off their culture, they're, they're trying to get people to interact as well with the culture, which is yeah. like amazing. And I wish more politics yeah. can do that as yeah. in politicians, I mean. So yeah, that's just 
that's something I hope that will happen more in the future. And that would be good, I think, because I think that, you know, as you say, when you look at what someone like Obama has posted, I always look at them and think, oh, I've not read that, you know, that's a really interesting, you know, book that he suggested there or something like that. And you think of someone like Obama, you know, the, 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 the British equivalent, you know, there was no British equivalent to Obama, you know, in the past, you know, but, but there was a politician called Dennis Healy, uh, who was in the 1980s. It, well, he was in the Labour, Labour uh, Party since the Second World War. And he was a great reader and, and a great lover of poetry and so on, and a great visitor to classical music and things like that. And he talked a lot about that. You get very few politicians like that. So you, you have someone like Nicola Sturgeon, you have Obama, you have someone like Dennis Healy, um, and, um, and Vaclav Havel. You know, you, you, you know they, they, they're ones who use culture to illuminate the work they do, um, influence the work they do, but they don't control it. So you, you have politicians like that, but then you have also politicians like in you know, communist um, Soviet Union or you know, even some of the um, Eastern Euro former Eastern European countries now, which are heading towards kind of dictatorships or you know, they call it illiberal democracies. Um, you, you, you have them where they're beginning to look at using culture as an arm of the state, really. Um, so it's, 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 it's um, you, know, you, it, it, it's, you know, it's like anything, good politicians and bad politicians will, will use them in different ways. There, there will be other examples, I'm sure, but they're the ones that kind of spring most to mind uh, on, on that subject. Yeah, it's actually quite interesting to like think about how like, especially because like obviously some people put politics and culture together, but it's very rare to think about that, especially when politics and politicians um, either use cu um, culture and art, culture, yeah, sorry, culture and art, and they either use it like for them, like as in they use it against their people or like they use it to interact. And it's quite interesting how they use like the different meanings, the different reasons why they would use such like culture and yeah. So mm. that's a really interesting fact I actually didn't think about. So thank you. And also, yep, sorry. Can no, I was just thinking about the way culture has been used to oppose regimes as well. So you think about, you know, in South Africa and under apartheid, for example, how, you know, you'd have cultural movements against that, both in, in South Africa and in other countries as well. And you had, you know, when the, Berlin Wall was finally coming down in the 1989, you know, you had, you know, concerts on either side of the wall and so on. And so sometimes it's, it's it can be used very positively. Um, but I'm, I'm sorry, I inter interrupted you. No, no, I was, I was literally just going to say, like, um, you don't, I please, please carry on talking because yeah, you no. apologised early and it's like, no, this is no. absolutely helpful. Like, I'm going to okay. look back on this and I'm going to be like, oh, wow, I didn't think of that. So yeah, yeah. don't apologize for okay, okay. <laughs> not helping me so much. So, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah no, with the, I've, it's, it's also interesting because like with nowadays as well, because we do use a lot of um, arts and music um, now to like talk about politics as well and like culture. So obviously with the Black Lives Mo Movement and like with the help of like the internet like spotify and um other um software and other um websites like youtube they use um their platform to like speak out and like portray the politics and the um oppression sometimes as well so with pol um with um spotify they have like a playlist of different types of um black artists they can like bring out so it's really cool to see how nowadays like um not even just like um softwares and different types of platform just like how many people are now aware of it as well i'm going to go on to that a bit further on i have a question that links so i won't i won't diverge too much but yeah um so i forget there was um there was a documentary really i haven't seen it yet there's a documentary released recently about the rock against racism movement in the 70s and this is where you had um um you know, um, lots of, I mean, this was at a time when you had the growth of um, what was then called the National Front, which was basically a far right organization, you know, anti immigration, um, racist organization. They were beginning to win, um, you know, local council seats and so on. So there was concern about this. And you had, you know, a very sustained move by leading musicians of the time to really get involved through, you know, concerts, 
you know, live open air events, um, to oppose those kind of things, you know, in the best way they could, which was creating music and celebrating music and celebrating diversity and so on. So when, when one, one of your later questions is about, you know, significant change that has happened. And I think that was one of the most significant things in the 1970s, which helped off, which helped avoid, you know, the, the further growth of some of those organizations. I just can't remember the name of the documentary. I think it was called, I'll, I'll look it up for you and send it to you. Um, but the Rock, Rock Against Racism is probably quite a good um, group for you to look at actually because it wasn't just the, the musicians, it was poets and so on. It was very, you know, um, it was very kind of, um, you know, locally rooted in clubs and so on, but also these big things in, in Hyde Park, big concerts and so on. And it was the leading musicians of the time, most of them really. Um, wow, I actually didn't know about that. that yeah, is... it's quite interesting. I mean, it's, it's quite, it, it was a kind of, um, it, it's unfair to say it was, it wasn't the Black Lives Matter its time, but it was it was it was the artists had really got behind this this concern about the rise of the far right, and there was in the seventies you know concern about this, and um, and and it was a really successful uh, protest movement, um, and um, so yeah, I can dig out some stuff on on that for you. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> that, like, I, it's it's fine that it doesn't. It's, it's not like the Black Lives Matter, no. but it's still really important how people use art to stop something like a far right and racism to uprise, which is a shame that I didn't find any articles about. So I'm glad you told me about. No, no, so. don't worry. I mean, there's a, there's there's many years, you know. Of um, yeah. <laughs> you're looking at just the you know from the fifties onwards, you're still looking at seventy years. So it's quite a lot of. Quite a lot of time and um, the other the other significant movement i suppose was things like um how you had um things like the the way artists got involved in things like the miners strike of the 1980s and things like the the pride movement and the you know gay liberation movement and so on how um you know you've had significant arts involvement in pop i mean in a way you could say that culture is politics anyway, you know, and, 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 um, and how, you know, culture is used to, you know, to, to support progressive movements. And actually, you know, you shouldn't, you know, also culture can be used to, to support some really awful things as well. You know, the way that, you know, the, you know under communism in the, in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe and under Nazism in Germany, you know, the way culture was, you know, the arm of the state to communicate with, with vast numbers of the population and convince them, you know, showed the really bad ways that, that culture can be used um, by politicians when they, when they want to do that. Um, so it's, it's, it's um, you know, it, it, it's looking, I think, at, you know, how these things can, you know, how the act of creation of culture or the act of, you know, people's everyday lives, um, is is um, makes up you know good policy. I've just actually read it's not out yet. It, it, it's it's a fa fantastic book about everyday lives and politics. And rooted throughout this is about how culture makes up culture locally for people and their everyday life. And it might be you know going to the pub. It might be you know the the bingo club. It might be the the elders group they belong to. Um, it might be the, you know, the voluntary groups they work with. It might be the, you know, the National Trust membership they have or whatever. This everyday life is part of their culture, but it's also part of how politics works as well, how people engage with each other through different ways of, um, of organising themselves. There's, there's um, you know, the, the, the people often organise, you know, people often organise for change, not just through political parties, but through, you know, local organisations, through amenity societies, you know, through things like in Bristol, there's a very strong civic society, which looks after the, the way the public realm looks, you know, currently arguing against tall buildings and so on. Um, so it, it, it's, it, it kind of merges all together in this kind of, you know, difficult to define way of, um, you know, in, in how people create things and organize their lives and make change happen. Yeah, sorry.
thank you again for helping me realize that like when I thought of culture I, I, I think I was thinking a bit too broad about it because I was thinking oh it's just based on traditions just long life traditions mm -hmm. but you don't ever think about like everyday routines yeah. and like even like what you said about the civics and how they like try and make how they make overall like Bristol or yeah. a town themselves mm -hmm. look like that as a part of a culture it's quite interesting to like realize so I think what what from what I now know my moral is is that culture and politics is something that can intertwine in a very confusing matter but it can yeah. also be well not defined as easily but also can be shown as such a huge complicated topic that can make sense once you dive deep into it but can also be can, that can also vary between different people as you mentioned with the 12 what was the the 12 it was a 12 page question thing you had well that was the european capital of culture bid yeah 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 i mean that that's a particular um that was a, a um an award made every to every member of the european union for one year would be European capital of culture. So, and, and you, what, what the European Union did, first of all, they used to have an open competition so anybody could apply. And then after a while they said, well, it's, it's the UK's turn. You need to have an internal competition and, uh, and decide yourself and then we'll approve it and so on. So when we bid, it was for 2008, although the bid was in in 2003. And Bristol was shortlisted, but didn't win. Liverpool one, so Liverpool was European capital of culture then. There will never be again a British European capital of culture because we've left the European Union, or we are leaving the European Union. Yeah. I don't, can't remember where we are now with it. It's, it's, um, anyway, so um, there, there won't be one again. Um, but what that did do was, you know, give it to a city within a country. Um, so, for example, Weimar in Germany was a European capital of culture. Liverpool was one. Glasgow was the first British one, actually, in, in 1980. And, um, and then you had other cities um, in, in Europe who had got it. There's, there's a whole list on there. The Wikipedia has quite an interesting page on European capital of culture, actually. And each one then had to define culture in what it meant to them as a, as a, as a place, as a city, and then going further down into kind of neighbourhoods and so on. But also as a country, which is quite difficult. When you think about, you know, Britain, Britain is a country made up of four nations. You know, the, the culture of Scotland is very different to the culture of, of London, for example, or, or the rest of England. Similarly, Welsh, you know, Wales has its own distinctive culture. Um, and yet we all kind of share one as well. You know, it's, um, it, it's one of the problems with Britain is it's it's called the United Kingdom, but it's not really that united, really. And um, and um, you know, but culture is one of those things that should be able to bind people together. Um, at, at the moment, you think it's it's you know it, it's not fulfilling that role fully, um, but it should be one of those things that brings people together um, simply through you know joy and you know the the delight of being you know, in, in, with crowds of people at a theatre or at a concert, you know, or, or you know, in a dance club or, you know, right down to a, you know, a reading group in a library. And so on. Of course, one of the problems is the past, you know, the year next March before we've ever, any of us have had to be able to experience much of these things because everything's been closed with this damn pandemic, really. And, um, and so, you know, once that happens, you know, we might begin to get some of these things back again. Um, but, but of course, culture has both been seen during this pandemic as incredibly important for people, you know, so things like levels of reading have gone up, things like consumption of, you know, movies on Netflix and things like that have gone up on TV series. Um, and the government has had to bail out the cultural sector really heavily because they know that if that goes under, you know, that will have the most devastating impact on places, whether that's a small village or a major city like Bristol, you know, imagine Bristol losing a number of its cultural infrastructures, you know, the theatres or film centres or clubs and so on, um, you know, it would be really quite disastrous. It may happen though still, given the way things are going. Um, so, so I think, you know, culture is incredibly important. The other thing is, if you, you know, if you, when you use the word culture, often that's off-putting to people. And, you know, they say, well, I'm not, I'm not a cultured person. You know, you know, but then, you know, they read and they go to the cinema or they like, you know, 
classical music or they might like you know 60s music or they might like hip-hop or whatever you know they might not necessarily describe themselves cultured or, or as a cultural person but, but it's one of those words which is both absolutely essential and one that people tend to avoid as well sometimes i i think that you know that was gonna that's gonna help at least my goal is with the definition or what i want people to think about what culture and politics is in this context is not only is it something as broad as tradition such as like me being a nigerian i know my traditions of having um there's a twins um, i'm a twin and the condition is, and the tradition is that um the firstborn is called taiwo and the secondborn is called kende and that we're supposed to have beans and such but it's not even just that culture but it's also the culture of how like you wake up and such and not to think that just because you don't have like a cultures from like the country in general that you are still cultured with like the little things you do within your family within your daily life but well, i think you're in, you're on to an interesting point there about how the word can be defined in different in this is really awkward isn't it how the word culture can be defined in different cultures really you know so you know we've um i was fortunate to go to nigeria a couple of years ago and I went to Lagos to attend the, the Lagos Book Festival that takes place there. Are you from Lagos or are you from another? No, I mean, I'm, I'm part of the state of Lagos. I don't right, live yeah. in Lagos City itself, yeah, but yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I found it an incredibly overwhelming experience, really, you know, just the sheer size of it and the number of people and so on. But what really struck me there was I, I, I spent most of my time actually in a hotel because I was attending this book festival who we had partners with. It's called Ake Book Festival. And then... Um, but the sheer strength of African writing that, that we know, well, we're beginning to get better on it over here, particularly publishing now is taking on many more um, translated fiction, you know, black fiction um, particularly is growing quite heavily now over here, um, not before time really. And, um, and, but I was just struck by the sheer strength of how that, of what existed, but also how it permeated a lot of things that I simply didn't know about, you know, in terms of the, the life of that place. Um, and then, and I, I thought Lagos was a really interesting, I mean, one of our big areas of work is about cities and about the future of cities. And Lagos is a really interesting case study because, you know, it, it's not only does it have the same problems every city has, you know, homelessness, poverty, future of work, corruption, you know, politics, whatever. But it's kind of writ large, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's huge. I mean, it's not, you know, we have a homeless problem here, but my goodness, you know, Lagos has an enormous homeless problem, you know, and so I thought it was a really interesting place and, and how the, but I, I was just so struck how strong this community of writers particularly was within, within this. And it was all rooted within a kind of tradition of, you know, um, I can't quite describe it, but how, how people had grown up in different communities of the place, almost tribes in a way, you know, how, how they'd, they'd come up of these different, um, um, different areas of, of the country. And I, we, are, we are planning to do more, actually, with Nigeria, um, particularly with the, with the book festival over the next few years. With the, again, the pandemic has just stopped all work on that. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, we do have, yeah. When you mean tribes, as in tribes within the city or in the um, overall country, because we have tribes overall in the yeah. country, but yeah, it was, so. It was coming from those kind of different traditions, really, and, you know, uh, whether, you know, some of it was about oral storytelling, some of it was about, you know, the written word, some of it was about poetry, um, some of it was about music. Um, I mean, it was quite an interesting book festival because, you know, books was only were only one part of it. It was all about those different ways basically telling stories I guess is what it what it was and how those stories contribute to the kind of you know um the place that it is the imagination of the place the history of the place you know in a way I mean that but that goes right back to the kind of Greeks and the tradition of oral storytelling there and mind you they were all involved in politics and religion as well so you uh, you can't get away from it can you so no you can't escape <laughs> The other thing I was thinking about, another area where politics and culture intersect is, is writers and human rights. 
and you've got very strong organizations around the world um, who work on this. Often their job is to protect writers who are imprisoned under threat. Um, and it, it's all tied together with something called PEN, P-E-N, PEN International, and there's English PEN, there's Welsh PEN, there's Scottish PEN, there's French PEN, there's Turkish PEN, and so on. And it's often writers who are most, who are, who are most vulnerable to attack, although by no means, you know, that, you know, all artists are during difficult periods and by difficult regimes. Um, but it is one of those where there is a, where there's an interesting series of things you can look at. Um, as part of that. Yeah, no, I, with journalists in general and writers, yeah, I really commend them and like their bravery because especially in more, um, in countries that are more oppressed there, they're more likely to get harmed, if not unfortunately killed because of what they've written. Yeah. Um, so sorry, a little bit off topic, but um, do you know, um, there's a little, but there's a game called Minecraft. If I'm oh, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, a person who's really good at, so we have different types of Minecraft people, people who play for task, people who want to be creative and make different types of buildings. And the creative, he or she made a forbidden library where it shows all the journalists and writers who were unfortunately killed by voicing mm -hmm. out their opinions, yeah. by telling telling the world what's going on in their country and it's a massive library and it's just it's so it's it's sad and also just surreal at the same time so yeah no the idea of journalists and writers in such oppressed countries is something that's definitely worth well definitely yeah. welcome and i would wish i want to mention that as well yeah. so yeah we're doing work with them on writers under threat and about um, issues around freedom of speech and issues of democracy. So it's quite a big part of our work next year. Okay, um, let me do the next question. So this is based on around how I started my timeline. So I started my timeline in the 1950s because one of the big cultural change that I um, realised, I've researched, was the influx of J um, Jamaican immigrants in Bristol yeah. and that was kind of like the start of well for me anyway the bristol sound people introduced being introduced to caribbean music such as reggae and yeah so you've already mentioned some other like political changes and such like that um but the first question i have is apart from the 50 well sorry it's a bit vague but um in the 50s apart from the jamaican immigrants is there any other cultural changes that may have been overlooked due to the due to the that change so yeah yeah i mean i, I mean it's quite interesting looking back i mean i was born in 1960 so i um i kind of look at it through you know books that i've read or films i've seen or music i've heard and so on i mean the 50s was a really in a way, the 50s was the kind, in part of the 50s was the, was the boring decade, you know, it was, it was, you know, the, the, the 40s was the Second World War and the, you know, the building of the kind of New Jerusalem of the National Health Service and so on. The 50s, the Conservatives have got back into power, you know, they, they ruled until 1964, um, 63, 64. And, um, and, you know, it, it was a kind of stable, you know, the, the Prime Minister at the end of that period near the end of that period said you know you'd never had it so good and in a way you know compared to the war years which were you know full of danger and death and worry and and you know but also were quite exciting years you know in a way you you know you were defeating nazism you were then building a new country afterwards but you needed some kind of stability but you know in, in the 1950s you know there were still the remnants of food rationing for example you know early on in that period so there was, there was one, one significant change in terms of the makeup of Britain you've mentioned is absolutely key, which is that, you know, groups of people from the, 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 the kind of empire in a way coming to Britain, but predominantly, you know, black immigration really changed this country and changed cities, you know, quite, quite a lot, really. Um, and Bristol in particular was one of those, although London and, and others were similar. I, I spent a lot of time working in Bradford um, and um, and that was, of course, a big influx, particularly of Asian um, people who came in to work in the textile factories um, and um, 
uh, and you know who now make up quite a large proportion of that population. Leicester is another one, and so you had the kind of you know the African Caribbean immigration, you had the the Asian immigration, um, and and it changed you know, you know so culturally it changed things. You know, you know it changed them in terms of how places looked. It changed them simply because of who you saw on the streets. You know, I mean, it was, you know, it, it, you know, there were black people in Britain before this 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 immigration, but it, you know, it was just massive change for people, and and you know that caused a lot of, you know, concern, and you know there was a rise of racism and so on uh, because of that. But also in terms of building a kind of modern multicultural society, it, it, it was a you know it was, you know it was a tremendous shift. There was also the whole decline of empire, which is worth just noting, you know, because Britain did have this huge empire, which was simply not feasible, uh, you know, morally at all, um, economically, financially, but after the Second World War and the real strong push for independence of a lot of those countries, you know, it was inevitable that, that empire would unravel fairly quickly, although we still have remnants of it now. That was another shift. I think there was a shift too in how the country became it's difficult to describe it, but how it became modern, you know, so, you know, when you look back at, you know, the politicians of that period, you know, they do look like, you know, upper class, fuddy-duddy, you know, um, conservative with a small c, whichever party they're in. But, you know, Prime Minister like Harold Wilson in the 1960s, who, you know, won back the country for Labour, you know, was incredibly modern in his thinking, you know, in terms of, you know, and um, you know, he called it the white heat of technology. It was really how we now talk about the internet and you know this kind of clumsy talk about things like the fourth industrial revolution and so on. You know, he was talking then about you know the need to renew the country to embrace technology and science particularly, and and you had this growth of quite a liberal period in the 1960s. So, for example, you had you know the um, you know um, you had the abortion act, you know, which um, gave women freedom over their bodies. Um, you had the um, homosexuality being legalised. And, um, and so, you know, these kind of people who you look on and think, well, you know, they, 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 they're, they don't look, imp you know, they're incredibly impressive politicians. I think one of the periods, particularly the 60s period, when a lot of this kind of, you know, you could call it liberation actually happened, um, you know, was, was, was led by people now who people think are kind of old fashioned and so on, but actually they were incredibly radical. And it was also the first, uh, there was the Race Relations Act, you know, which came in, which was, you know, following some of the kind of riots that had happened in Notting Hill, but also a reflection of the kind of society that we were, that we were creating in, in that period. So I think there was, I think, you know, this, this new generations of people coming in who were really, you know, bought into, you know, help the economy, you know, it was a, you know, very, you know, the arrangement was, you know, we, we needed people to work in the health service and so on. I mean, one of the politicians who led that was a politician called Enoch Powell, you know, who, who was the Minister of Health. And if you look him up, you know, uh, you know, again, he's now forgotten, but Enoch Powell did that work. And then in 1968, I think it was, did an, an infamous speech saying that if we don't stop immigration and so on, you know, the rivers of blood will flow in the streets and so on. So he, he shifted hugely his views during that period, although he may have always had those views that, you know, there was the pragmatic need to, to, to get employment into the, into the health service. And that's another thing which I think is really important, that kind of social revolution which happened particularly in the late 40s and the 50s. And, and that was both Labour and Conservative, you know, saw, you know, the growth of a modern welfare state, you know, the, the health service, which has been, you know, the most important thing that has happened in, in most people's lifetimes in this country. You know, the, the fact that you can go to a doctor and it's free at the point of delivery. You, know, you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about it. I mean, you might worry that it might take time to get treated and so on, but it's a huge difference in, in that. It's interesting as well, next, 2023 is the 75th anniversary of the National Health Service. And it'll be very interesting to see what the cultural response to that is. We're certainly planning things around that. You know, a very political move to, you know, give health to everyone, irrespective of class, race, gender, whatever. You know, um, now, you know, so well established in people's lives that it's almost taken for granted in a way um, that um you know it'd be really interesting what the response is of that and i if you look at the i don't know whether you saw the 
when Britain, London hosted the Olympics in 2012, there was an opening ceremony, which included that wonderful scene about the health service in it and so on. So, so uh, yeah, so it's, um, so, so I think there's that kind of social revolution. It also, you know, the conservative government of the fifties built more council houses than, than other governments, you know, so it's, you know, um, and you saw this then the beginning of the technological revolution, particularly in the sixties, which, you know, modest technology and science compared to, you know, what we had with the growth of the internet and so on. But um, so I think that, um, you know, now on the positive side, you've got the, you know, the multicultural societies, the, the vibrancy of places, the, the influence on culture, you know, the, particularly music, which is why I think you're right to focus on that, particularly with that, um, you know, those group of, of people coming into the country and into places. You know, the downside is, you know, the race riots, the growth of, you know, racism, you know, the, the um, employment practices that were, were still disgracefully in existence, you know. So um, there's so many things you can talk about here. Um, and one of the things which I think is really interesting, do you know about the Bristol bus boycott of the 1960s? Bristol bus boycott, no. so, so what happened was then um, the bus company wouldn't employ um, non-white conductors. The, the trade union refused to do it. Uh, the company refused to do it. And so uh, led by someone called Paul Stevenson, who, who's still alive, actually, and Roy Hackett, who's still alive, um, they got the, um, the, um, um, the black population to refuse to travel on the buses in Bristol. They boycotted the buses. It, it's a bit like the American civil rights struggle, actually. Um, and, um, and eventually they had to hire um, bus conductors and drivers and so on who were not white. Um, and so you have this significant civil rights struggle in Bristol, remarkably, um, which now is given its full recognition and due, you know, it, people see it as important. But at the time, of course, these were, you know, groups of people who were causing difficulty, you know, taking work away from people. Um, there's been some wonderful profiles done lately of, of the people involved, which I'll send you, I'll send you them. and. Um, and so you, you, you know, you had, you know, you had racism in, in, in working practices. Um, you had racism, you know, almost embedded in, you know, the, the, you had to bring in the Race Relations Act to make sure that people were treated equally and so on. Um, you had this vibrancy of places and but then you had the kind of, you know, the, the, the riots, particularly out, not, not in Bristol that period, um, but, but in London, Notting Hill riots and so on of the late 1950s, um, which led to the Notting Hill Carnival actually which is another interesting how a political riot over politics led to a significant cultural um, uh, program which is still going on pandemic notwithstanding um, the more significant riot was the one you pointed to in bristol in the early 1980s um, but don't do look at the um you know how the city began to change to um you know work with um, come to terms with, assimilate, um, you know, celebrate the different ranges and groups of people who would come into the place from from abroad. And it, you know, it, it, Bristol, it, as a port city, has always been a city of incomers. You know, it's always been a city where people have migrated to, um, and that's one of the kind of you know good things about it, really, because you've always had people coming in, renewing life, and so on. But, but those kind of, you know, these significant shifts in, in, the, in, in what happened in, in the country, but also the city, are ones I think you can mark quite easily. The part where you mentioned about um, just the whole, I think what I didn't think about also is, thank you for reminding me of technology. Technology is such yeah. a huge cultural yeah. Yeah. and yeah. change in, in, what, in the world itself. So, um, but the idea that um, obviously with Jamaican immigration and even just immigration from all the other um, British Empire, like country, the countries that were taken over by the, the British mm -hmm. at the time, like it wasn't something that, clearly it wasn't something that people in UK accepted immediately. Mm -hmm. It was something that had to slowly make its way and it's still developing right now, obviously. Mm -hmm. But just like the small things like um, how, like the riots like Notting Hill going in, um, coming something of, happiness instead of like instead of using instead of using that day of remembering something something terrible that happened they used it as 
a way to celebrate okay we made our differences and such and I think that's also key to remember especially when it comes to the changes in Bristol if not even UK so um yeah the boss boycott part I think I may have heard of it um it was when the whole when Edwards Colston's statue was pretty much overthrown and chucked into the <laughs> harbour um I they mentioned I I believe they mentioned him as a person they want to have as a statue due to his um, activism. You're, you're spot on. That's exactly where it was. The connection was made recently. You know, when the statue came down, and then people saying, "Well, what should we put in its place?" You know, and and um, one suggestion was Paul Stevenson. Paul himself said he doesn't want a statue. You know, he what he wants is lasting change to take place. You know, and that's absolutely right. I think. One of the, I mean, I've spent a lot of time working on statues and memorials and how you memorialise the past. And statues are problematic, you know, they, they, you know, every statue has a problem in a way. And statues are often put, well, not for charitable or good reasons, they're often put to fight proxy wars and, you know, um, conflicts by another name, really. I think also what, what is interesting as well is you, from those kind of things, is you had the development of things like the St Paul's Carnival in Bristol, um, you know, which is one of the premier events. Yeah, it, it, it hasn't happened for the last, um, it, it's, it's had um, difficulties, uh, but it's now back again, although obviously it couldn't take place this year um, because of the pandemic. I mean, this has been a lost year, hasn't it, in many, many ways when you, when you think of everything that didn't happen. But, it, you know, you had that. And then there's a really wonderful project in St Paul's, which, um, which is called the Seven Saints of St Paul's, which is an artist called Michelle Curtis, who has painted on the sides of houses these figures of these people who transformed Bristol, uh, the black leaders who transformed Bristol, or the bus boycott people. And if you have, ever have a chance to wander around them, um, it's a wonderful walk that you get um, where you see these incredible artworks by an incredibly talented artist just right on the side of a house. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not a little painting. This is on the side of a house and they're, they're really wonderful. And it celebrates that part of the, um, you know, those people who made significant change happen over a long-term period in Bristol. And, and that unites again, you know, culture and politics in that way. And of course, music is central to things like Notting Hill, central to St Paul's Carnival and so on. I'm um, just looking at some of your other questions. Um, so you're, at, you know, my understanding is is that you know Jamaican immigration was you know we didn't have the workers after the Second World War you know we needed people to go into the health service and so on you know the health service was such a major shift in terms of employment of, of nurses and support staff and doctors I remember the first time I was, I was ever operated on one of the most painful things that's ever happened to me was I, I bit my tongue and I had to have it stitched up um, that was painful and that was a doctor who had come over from India for example that and that was in the 1970s you know so you know you had this these you know this these this major influx of you know caring people talented people who transformed our lives actually you know there's no doubt about it you know that the, our life expectancy is so much better now because of that really and, and as i say sometimes it's taken a bit for granted i think but in terms of shifts in politics things like that um um you know were really important the third question or b i think it is yeah is about the tensions yes of course there were tensions you know there, there you know there were there was outright racism as we saw with the the bus boycott and so on and then there's the kind of softer tensions you know the you know the um you know like microaggressions yeah yeah and, and i don't want someone living next door to me and things like that you know and um and um and that you know is still around in a you know in, in some ways I have to say, though, that I think for all the issues that we face, this country generally is much more tolerant than when I was growing up. You know, I must say, you know, I find generally, you know, just, just by what you hear people say and so on. But also because I think you've had this influx of, you know, major cultural, um, you know, forces, where, you know, particularly music. I would say now as well, things like television and so on. You know, just now on BBC, there's this Steve McQueen series that's on. The acts, which is you know about black life in London, and um, and you know these are really super pieces of filmmaking, which um, you know really teach us all 
about the way people live their lives, their culture, without avoiding the kind of hard-edged nature of political reality and political life. Um, and but do it in, you know, an entertaining way as well. So you know, you you and, and that's what you know. Going back to rock against racism, what that said was, you know, we oppose racism, uh, and we're going to do it, you know, with some fun as well. You know, we're going to have music and dance and you know, comedy and poetry and so on. Um, so it's really you know this merging of culture and politics. The St Paul's riots, and um, I mean, there's a lot written about the St Paul's riots. You know, it's you know, it's very difficult to get to, you know, the, the police would argue, although I think they'd now admit that there was racism in the police force at the time. Um, and they certainly, you know, I, when you wrote to me, I thought I'll just do some more, you know, I'll remind myself of some of the reading I'd done on that. And there was quite a lot of work done around this, around the, the 50th anniversary. 50th anniversary, am I right? It was 81. No, the 40th anniversary. Yeah. Um, and um, and there's a filmmaker locally called Michael Jenkins. He's a local film, a black filmmaker. He's set up his own company. Um, he's developing a project on the dockside um, in Bristol, which is a boat for black arts, really. You know, music, poetry, mu um, theatre, whatever. You know, quite a big boat. And he's he's working on this right now. And it's quite an interesting again how you can do things culturally which then influence the kind of, you know, the political life. It's, it's almost like you need, you know, the word culture and politics to have, you know, culture with a capital C, but also culture with a small C and politics with a big P, which is your kind of parliament and acts of parliament and government and politics with a small P, which is how people interact on a daily basis, how they learn about each other, how they come, you know, how we come to a common understanding about, where society is and where it should be going. You know, at the moment, politics is so polarised. You know, there's no centre ground, really. And the centre ground was always quite vulnerable in this country. Um, but nonetheless, it's always been a place where we can all meet and, you know, actually compromise on things. And, uh, and I think that's been one of the problems. Um, so I think, St Paul's, you, you probably need to come to your own view, really, on, on what particularly happened there. But it was another one of those kind of pivotal moments, which people still talk about now uh, in the city as being a very important time. And, uh, you know, not, you know, around the same time, you had things like the riots in Hartcliffe as well um, in Bristol. So it was and there were lots of riots around the country as well. Um, you know, but, but the Bristol one, you know, it'd be interesting to see what kind of change you can track from that. Certainly policing has changed the way the police responded to the Colston statue. You know, they didn't stop it being pulled down. Um, you know, there was a very different um, response to that than there might have been 30 years ago. Um, and also, you know, things like the growth of the St Paul's Carnival and the, you know, there, there was various organisations like in, there's the Malcolm X Centre in, in, um, in St Paul's as well, who do cultural work. Um, but I would say, so that's a significant moment and you've got those other significant moments. I think coming more to now, we're in quite a different period now. So A, we've had the election of Marvin Rees as the mayor of Bristol, you know, the first um, mixed race mayor, um, you know, young, visionary, um, you know, incredibly talented, who came up through things like he worked at BBC Radio Bristol, for example, he worked in the health service, he worked for um, a group called Vosca, which is Bristol's voluntary organisations. So he's, you know, he's got some cultural background. He's very into poetry. He funds our city poet, for example, that we have. And, and you know, her work, Vanessa Kasule's work last year was, was very important to us the last two years. Vanessa was the poet of Colston statue coming down. Um, she wrote a very good poem called Hollow. So you've got that. You also had, um, at the, almost at the same time in a way, you had the first black Lord Lieutenant of Bristol. The Lord Lieutenancy is, a, is basically the Queen's representative in the region. So she, you know, when the Queen can't come to give awards or open something, the Lord Lieutenant will do some of that work. And that's Peaches Golding. And then you had the first um, black um, mayor of Bristol, Cleo Lake. So all of a sudden you had people in positions of power and influence uh, who were who were not from the usual groups of people, really. And, and that's been quite a shift. Um, 
And some people don't like it, but most people, you know, have seen this major shift happen. Um, and it's worked, you know, to a certain extent. I mean, it's all where it hasn't worked is because of things like the economic downturn due to the pandemic. And, you know, there's no money around at the moment. But, but certainly that's been a very important shift in terms of leadership within the city. And I think that will see significant changes as, you know, the mayor's introducing things like how, um, you know, you know, mentoring young people to come into business and into culture and so on. We're all working on those kind of things. Um, then you had the growth, you know, the really rapid growth of the Black Lives Matter movement, which, you know, very, the two most significant political movements of the last few years for me have not been the party political movements like, you know, Johnson and the Conservatives or Jeremy Corbyn and Labour. It's been the Me Too movement and it's been the Black Lives Matter movement, partly because they were so strong, uh, partly because they have seen change happen there. And, you know, one of the problems of political movements, I know I've been involved in so many in my lifetime, is how at the end of a, being involved in something is you inevitably feel a sense of failure because you haven't achieved what you want to achieve. But actually, you know, these movements are achieving some things. They're not achieving exactly everything they want to do, um, but they are achieving some things. And I think that's, you know, that, that, that is, 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 is good news for the future. It's just, it's just kind of sustaining those. And again, it's kind of cultural. You look at the response to the, you know, the, 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 the empty plinth where the Colston statue was, and, you know, the things that people put on there, you know, from the, you know, the Jen clenched fist thing that went up for a short period of time. And then someone put Darth Vader up the other day, I noticed as, yeah. as a joke. And then, and then you've got the argument. I mean, I'm not a huge fan of statues, to be honest. Um, but, but I am a fan of using those um, places to have, you know, imaginative artworks created. Um, and so there's a quite interesting, I think, case study around that as well, about how protest, politics, political movements um, and culture come together uh, in terms of, you know, creating change around those, those things. There's an empty plinth in Trafalgar Square and that's used to put um, artworks on. Um, it, 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 temporary artworks and they change. I mean, I used to, every time I would go to London, I would always go and see what, you know, what's on the fourth plinth this month and so on. And then, and of course I haven't been able to see what's on the fourth plinth for the whole year really. The most moving memorials I've ever seen are what's called the Stolpersteins, the stumbling stones in Germany, where they're little brass tiles put in the floor, the ground, and they're put outside the house or the flat of, of an individual or a family who were murdered by the Nazis. So the, the stones say something simply like, I'm, I'm, I'm crudely translating it, you know, but from this place on 31st of August, 1944, Herr and Herren and, you know, the names of them were taken to Auschwitz and killed. And, and you don't see these, um, you know, you have to look for them to begin with. And there's thousands of them there. You have to look to them, you know, because you you often when you're walking, you should look straight ahead. If you're looking at the ground, you you know, you'll bump into people. But when you see the first one, you can't not see them anywhere else. And it suddenly brings home to you, you you're on the very spot where obviously a family of people were forced from their home, probably at gunpoint, into some terrible truck or bus or whatever, transported to this concentration camp and murdered. And this is one of the most moving memorials. And who, but they're really recent, you know, the Germans didn't really, you know, West Germany in particular really struggled on how it would come to terms with its Nazi past, actually. It was only the post-1968 generation who really began to do that. And again, that's where culture and politics come together, you know. You've got these, you know, radical movements who often used, you know, culture. You know, one of the things about the 60s was the growth of things like poster culture, and how people created their own posters and so on for political campaigning. That's a part of culture, that's part of the arts. And, and you know, nowadays these posters are, you know, they, they go into museums as artworks and exhibits. What were originally things which you ran off on a little machine, pasted on a wall and forgot about really, you know, you moved on to the next one. We did an event recently where someone compared the Colston statue with the one which is very nearby Colston of, of Edmund Burke who was the MP for Bristol. And both of those statues were put up basically not to, you know, not to celebrate Burke and Colston away, but to, to, to try and solve political problems at the time in Bristol. 
between the merchants and the non-merchants, for example. Have you come across as part of this work something called the work on the Bristol curriculum? Have you come across that? This is a proposal yeah. which has come out of, um, oh, what's his name at Colston? Phil Castang. He, he's the, the programmer, I think. Um, but he's been working with others on a, on a Bristol education curriculum which will help put right the, some of the missing bits of Bristol's history that people learn about. So for example, when I, were, when I was at school, I didn't grow up in Bristol, when I was at school and I did history, um, we learned about the Tudors and Stuarts, you know, centuries ago. I didn't learn anything about slavery, about industrial issues, about um, the history of women getting the vote and things like that, none of that. Um, you know, you, yeah, and, and you, this is an attempt to kind of look at a curriculum which which tells people, you know, a, a, a more detailed story of what makes up a place. So again, it's kind of politics with a small p. It's education, it's culture coming together. Um, so yeah. I We're, think that should happen. <laughs> Especially because when you said that, crazy enough, I did the same thing with history. I only learned about the Tudors yeah. and nothing about slavery mm. or the women's right movement. I'm just lucky enough to be in a generation where I had the internet to yeah. easily browse yeah. what happened during the suffragette movement or what happened during the um, Atlantic slave trade and such. So yeah, and I think I, I hope education's changed a bit since I was at school, but you never know really. I think you know it, it was very much led by the examining boards, and you had to just teach what you were examined on. And and yeah. there is we we've spent quite a lot of time trying to. Um, published material about Bristol's history and you know as we published a number of books for example and um, which is we, we produced quite a few graphic novel type stories about Bristol um, one of which is a history of Bristol in 200 pages in graphic novel style you oh, might like want to read that actually because that's um that that's that and that covers things like you know how Bristol changed in the centuries how um you know it dealt with the slave trade in a very you know honest and creative way um, it um, and then it went right into the 20th century. You know, the two, you know, one of the other significant movements in Bristol's history, just slightly prior to your area of time, is the Blitz in Bristol in the Second World War, which really knocked the heart out of the city. And you know, a lot of the historic parts of the city were destroyed. Um, lots of communities were displaced. Um, and, and although it's slightly outside of your period, it does impinge on your period because. You know, people had to be housed after the war. You had the growth of kind of out of town estates, out of city centre estates. You had tower blocks being created, uh, which were not just wartime results, because much further on, but just it, there was a belief then that people should be housed in tall towers. Um, you had the breakup of communities and so on. So, you know, th there's a number of significant factors that are worth just, just looking at that. You know, you've just got one project to do, not work the whole history of Bristol. You pretty much mentioned it already but like some just an overall summary but um number six is what do you think is the biggest cultural change that happened between the 50s and now we can like we can separate from before 19 um before the 2000s and post 2000s to make it easier but yeah what do you think is the biggest cultural change that's happened well i think we've talked about some of them already i think yeah. um i think and because you can't divorce politics and culture in some ways, the kind of you know, growth to seniority of um, mixed race and black politicians in the city uh, in recent years has, has significantly changed things and will change things more in the future. Um, I think before that, you know, it's quite difficult, isn't it? So you, you, the, the 50s was that kind of wave of immigration which changed the city. The 60s, you can't, divorce Bristol from the rest of the country in the kind of, you know, 60s revolutions, you know, the political movements and, you know, the growth of, you know, um, you know, even things like, you know, you know, the Beatles and things like the impact of, of that kind of music on society. I think that, um, you know, this is quite difficult. I mean, when I saw this, I thought, I hope we don't get to question six because I thought it was really difficult to answer. Because it, it, it's, no, it's fine. It's pretty vague. It's, it's not vague, really. It's just it's just trying to trying to identify exactly what was the pivotal moment. And that, 
the M Shed, which is the, have you ever been to M Shed, which is the museum? Yeah, of yeah. They, they spent, when they were setting up M Shed, they were working out what were the real shifts to happen in Bristol? And, and what do you mark? You know, was it the first mosque in the city, you know, things like that, you know, was it, um, you know, was it some of the things we've talked about, you know, was it, you know, the, the suffragette movement in the 1920, uh, uh, te, te, end of the First World War and into the 1920s and so on. It, it's, and it's often, you know, so I think that one of the most cultural shifts was that bus boycott, to be honest, in the 1960s, because it, it, it really shook up employment relations. Um, it showed that civil rights were critical to a good society. Um, it um, transformed, eventually, um, some of the potential lives of people, some of their lives, potentially. But at the time was, you know, not given the reception that it should have received, you know. Um, now it's seen as very significant. Um, so it often depends on, 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 on individual people as well. Um, as I said, in terms of, you know, for me, you know, the, the, the change in politics that has happened in recent years has been an incredible shift. The Blitz and its impact on Bristol was, was a big shift in terms of your timeline because of post-war development in the city. I think the, you know, another major cultural shift has been trying to bring some of the city back for its people. So, you know, Queen Square, have you ever been in Queen Square in the centre? It's a big square just near the waterside. It's a um, beautiful square. You know, you, you walk around that, I mean, this is quite peaceful and so on. Um, but actually, you know, not so long ago, a two lane highway went diagonally across it and cars would drive across it and buses. You know, things like changing the fabric of the city so it's more belonging to the people of the city is another one of those cultural shifts. I think another significant cultural shift is about how actually arts and culture are treated so much more seriously in Bristol now. I think, you know, that's been a shift probably of the last 25 years, I would think, you know, and, and with that, you because of things like the Capital of Culture bid, you were able to really put culture up on a higher level within the city, uh, politically, economically, socially, uh, and, uh, and so on. Um, I would say um, things like, you know, you, you, the growth of things like the St Paul's Carnival have been very important shifts, um, as has um, the, um, you know, the renewal of much of the cultural infrastructure. If you want one organisation actually which sums up, you know, both changing fortunes and the importance of culture in the city to its social, economic and political life, you look at something like the Watershed Media Centre, Watershed in the centre of Bristol which has done so much to, you know, is probably the, you know, up until recently, because everything's been closed, but, you know, used by the widest range of people for the longest period of time each day of any cultural organisation in the city. And, um, and has taken on board shifting trends in technology, um, but still retained at, at its heart, you know, the need for showing the best of world cinema in, in the city of Bristol. Um, there are so many things. I suppose big change was, you know, in terms of it was things like the, the, the waves of immigration that came in post Second World War um, and the way the society is involved in them. And then you can't divorce it from, you know, the big national changes. So, you know, the things like what was happening legislatively in terms of, you know, um, legalisation of homosexuality and so on um, for what might have happened in, in a place. You know, so it's, um, yes. When, that, when writing down that question, I was thinking, okay, obviously this is for you, it's a you question, yeah. what your views are, but overall it's hard to identify because it does vary for yeah. people because obviously to me, me, I, I'd probably say like my biggest cultural change is obviously the start of Black Lives Matter movement yeah. and like actually like voicing out problems because obviously me as a black girl, I've always like struggled with my identity yeah. and to have that being portrayed and yeah. letting everyone know that this isn't a solo thing, this is something yeah. everyone experienced. I was like, wow, yeah. it's actually a huge, like yeah. just a huge eye opener. So it does vary between people. So I'm glad I answered, asked the question because it helps me verify that it's not something that can be like easily, what's the word? It's very, it's very, it varies for um, different people. I can't, I, I, I can put down in my paragraph in my article that 
it's not um what what the biggest changes doesn't have to be the same for people it can be this it can be it can be the um it can be the influx it could be stuff that's happened in world war ii that's affected yeah. Yeah. um that affected bristol now it could be overall legislations in uk such as the movement and like such as um lgbtq and gay rights and such so i'm glad i've asked you that it's also really nice to know what your opinion is as well so can i just mention yeah. one thing which comes to mind actually on that so so you know bristol was was the center of tobacco production for a long time you know making oh, cigarettes okay. yeah i mean it, you know you know factories made you know we we one of the leading producers and you know these employers at that time were very you know they would they would, you know they 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 weren't bad employers actually you know they they would you know pensions and social clubs and things like that and and now bristol doesn't produce much doesn't um make much tobacco products at all um it's all gone to other countries uh, but that shift that happened there had a you know a huge impact on those communities you know so you grow up with this kind of employer for life who provides things for you beyond the um beyond the salary you know does create a social club for you does make sure your kids go to the pantomime every christmas um and so on and one of the shifts in in places has been cultural shifts as well as economic shifts has been the loss of those big employers who did a lot of that work not only provided work for a place and people in the place but also some of their social life and their cultural life as well and that's when it comes down it's quite personal isn't it as you said you know what the big shift for you has been black lives matter the big shift for others might have been how their community was displaced following bombing in the second world war and they had to you know go and live in a tower block eventually or into another property and so on it's a really interesting question how people mark those shifts in their lives i think and um and i think you probably get you know, you'd ask 100 people and you might get 80 different answers or whatever but what's interesting is how there are periods in everybody's life that that does make shift happen actually you know it, it's quite interesting how that happens now we're in a very interesting period at the moment aren't we because you know with black lives matter with me too um with those movements um really beginning to have some impact um but we're still a long way to go it'll be very interesting to see what happens next on those but they are two you know of the most significant movements of our time and the other one of course is the environmental movement and you know extinction rebellion and um you know whatever you think about their tactics and so on they've clearly helped try and increase put that on the agenda much more than um than perhaps we um we've we've done in the past really um it's quite interesting well how you know i've been involved in you know anti racist protest movements environmental movements social movements and so on and and as i mentioned earlier you know you kind of having been involved in those for years you know a certain exhaustion sets in and fatigue and you you know sometimes the movements are co-opted by politicians who then you know introduce legislation which helps move things along a little bit other times you simply you know you don't win and that you know so it'd be very interesting to see what happens now i do think though politics is you know in a way we've gone through a very really difficult period with international politics so with trump and with the kind of rise of the strong men in you know in in eastern you know former eastern european countries and some of those are now moving on or in trump's case will finally be kicked out at some point because he has lost the election but he's going to be forced out isn't he i think in some way or dragged yeah. out whatever but you know things will change i think now you know all of a sudden there's kind of it's crude to say that there's kind of grown ups in the white house now and and what's that vice president because i she's in a good position you know um you know in terms of the next election as well i think i uh, i think we're in quite an interesting period actually and hopefully a progressive one as well this is a question i just thought of right now but um this is kind of like overall and also if it works in uk but what i learned what well, as a as a young as a youth with like protest and such in the past i be, it from from my view as a, as a young kid um it sounds it's it seems like in the past protests happened to be more effective than the protests now not as in like everyone now realizes what's going on more like the political like what politicians notice out of it so 
One example is the Hong Kong strikes. Yeah, so yeah. in the past, uh, I believe early 2000s, where they had a strike of almost half a million and it actually worked and um, politicians took to their knees and actually changed what um, to what they wanted. But now with, start, with the um, Hong Kong riots that happened for more than a year and had millions of people, not only in Hong Kong, but around the world fighting against it, but it didn't actually work out at the end. Mm -hmm. So do you feel like it's more, it's, it, it's, it's a, I'm in, in other words, what's your opinion about it? Sorry, there's not really a proper question. It's like, it, do you think that's a change for the, well, it's, it doesn't sound like the change for the better. It sounds. I think that, yeah. I mean, I, you know, you, you, in a way you, you know, Martin Luther King said the, you know, the arc of justice, you know, bends upwards and it's, but it's slow, you know, and then, and it's quite easy and often quite right to be pessimistic about these things. You know, I think of some of the things, you know, that I've been involved with. So for example, I'm a big campaign on animal rights, for example, and I, it's just defeat after defeat after defeat in a way that you face, although there, there might be some slightly better news coming forward on those. And I think the environmental movement is a really difficult movement because you are asking people to give up quite a lot now for the benefit of generations further down the line. And you won't be around to see that actually, you know, in a way it's a gift you're giving people further down. And, you know, this, this time people have got lots of things to worry about as well as, you know, thinking about the future. Um, Hong Kong is a really interesting example because we, we were doing a little bit of work on Hong Kong. We were going to have speaking in our series, uh, someone called Joshua Wong, who was one of the leaders of the democracy movement. And he's just been in prison for 13 months yeah. today, in fact. Um, yeah, he's just been imprisoned. No, yesterday he's been imprisoned. Um, right. He has to plead guilty because the charge was, you know, he led a demonstration, you know, perfectly visible and so on. And, and these incredibly brave people fighting against, you know, China, basically, um, it, you know, are going to find it very hard. And I think that's the same thing with, you know, it, it's often easy to create, you know, and, and politicians are very good at, you know, giving people something when there's when there's a problem. You know, they'll change legislation a bit or improve things. That's why I was quite interested in that period in the 60s when, you know, you had Roy Jenkins as Home Secretary who introduced quite liberal rules, really. Um, much more liberal than, you know, maybe it was such a seismic shift, actually, you know, you know, from that. Nowadays, you know, the, the kind of big change needed is really systemic change and we're changing systems. And that's much harder, I think. Um, I think that what gives me the hope is that not only have you seen the rise of things like, you know, Black Lives Matter is a totally different movement to the anti-racist movement I was involved in years ago. For a start, it's black led, you know, it's, um, it's, it's, you know, it, it's creative, it's passionate. It's got some momentum behind it. Um, and so, and you know, getting Harvey Weinstein put in prison was a was another victory on that because so many people wouldn't have, you know, in the past, they just simply wouldn't have believed that. So I think, you know, you know, there's an old saying on the left, but, you know, which is, you know, how do you feel it's pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. You know, you think things are gonna be hard and they are, but you're determined to do something about them. So I suppose that's that's a you know that's a that's the kind of mantra that you know certainly I've lived by. The other one which I've got really interested in lately is there's been talk about you know how do you become a good ancestor, you know, so that people you know a hundred years on look back at you and say, well, actually they did that for us. So you know if you look back a hundred years, slightly less, you think who who really changed things then? You think well. Actually, who changed things then? It was things like the suffragettes who changed things. You know, they, you know, they got women the vote, um, not perfectly to begin with, but they eventually changed things like that. What changed things in Bristol in the 1960s? It was Paul Stevenson and the others who led the bus boycott. You know, these are good ancestors, and I think this is a really good thing to use in a way that, you know, you 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 think, you know, a hundred years on, will they look back at work I did and think, well, he helped things or he. No, he didn't help at all, did he? You know, and I, and I think that's something which is quite an interesting way of looking at it. And we're doing a bit more work around that. Um, but I think you've certainly got to, you know, retain a a certain amount of optimism.
that things will get better because otherwise you don't act. And I think, you know, you've got to act to try and make change happen. My goodness, we've covered a huge amount of ground here. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, I thought when I saw the question, I thought we'll easily do this in 40 minutes. But no, it was um, it's been a really enjoyable conversation, actually. It has. I, I feel like the last question has pretty much been answered yeah. anyway. So, yeah. Wow. So I've, <laughs> I've been in small notes and I like have like yeah. a whole, just both sides covered with. Yeah, <laughs> I had to quickly pick up a pencil and I was like, oh, red pencil. That's all I can do. With it.